Okay, so I'm Michelle Kaufman from the Miami Herald. I've been a soccer writer for 35 years. Uh, I've covered six World Cups and uh, 14 Olympics and a million other things. And I am now, um, have been, since I returned to Miami to the Miami Herald in 1996, I've been covering soccer here. So I covered the Miami Fusion, for those who remember that team. And now I cover Inter Miami and the welcome of Lionel Messi to this club, which has been unbelievable, like nothing else I've ever experienced in all my years in soccer. So I'm going to introduce our panelists very briefly. Um, you probably know who they are if you follow soccer. And I think we're just going to have a very informal conversation about how do we cover the sport, the challenges of covering the sport, especially in the day of social media, where there's so much garbage out there and we have to sift through it and figure out what's true, what's half true, and what's completely false. That is not easy to do in this day and age. So we're all veteran journalists, authors, and various other uh, media people. So we have here Ben Jacobs, uh, very well known soccer journalist, um, CBS, where else, everywhere else that you can be seen. Talk Sport Now, Premier League commentator. Talk Sport Now, Premier League commentator, has seen it all. How many World Cups, how many years have you been covering the sport? Not as many World Cups as <laughs> Guillaume, that's for sure, but I've done four right. World Cups, and obviously now I focus on news breaking, so I'm sure we'll get into it, but the Messi to Miami story, I think, covered a lot of the things that you alluded to and the challenges that are presented in modern journalism when you're trying to cut through the nonsense and get to the reality of what's actually happening. And I'm looking forward to delving into it more. Yes, absolutely. Next, over here, we have Guillaume Balaguer, a very world-renowned journalist, author, who also has the, I believe, the only authorized biography of Lionel Messi. A lot of people claim to have written things about Lionel Messi, no Lionel Messi, but he really does, I think, right? So he's going to tell us all about a little bit about that and also what it, what it was like uh, covering him in Barcelona. We're going to discuss a little bit of the differences about what the media is like in Europe and what experience the athletes have with the journalists in Europe versus what we have here. And there are challenges and there are bridges that need to be formed because we have different expectations of our sports stars in the United States than they have around the world. And so Lionel Messi is learning that right now as we speak. And next on the end over there is Tom Bogert um, from The Athletic. Break stories all the time, in fact, annoys me probably <laughs> once a month, maybe more than once a month on something that I think I should be breaking on the team that's in my community and he's breaking it from wherever the heck it is that you live. Um, so Tom, you know, if you could just introduce yourself a little bit, how long have you covered the sport? Where do you live? Yes, yeah, so I'm um, in the New York City area, proudly in New Jersey. Um, yeah, I've been covering Major League Soccer for a while now um, and it's been, it's been a lot of fun to watch the league grow and watch everything happen. Okay, so we're gonna get started because the panels are pretty short. All four of us like to talk, we are journalists, and I think we have 20 minutes, so that's a very short period for each of us. Uh, so I will do my best to edit myself, and hopefully everybody else will too. Um, I'll start by just saying that when Lionel Messi arrived here, uh, when he had made his announcement, first of all, June 7th, I was under the Eiffel Tower on vacation with my husband, and we sort of knew that this might be coming in the first few weeks of June, and I prayed every day that it would not be during the eight days that I was on vacation in France. I had four days in Provence, four days in Paris. I said, please, Leo, whatever you do, don't announce on one of those days. But of course, I am a journalist, you guys are too, you know that the news always breaks when you're on vacation. So I was under the Eiffel Tower, I got a phone call that said, are you near a computer? And I said, no, I'm under the Eiffel Tower. And the person said, get near a computer. Leo is going to make his announcement today, and he's coming to Miami. My life changed completely at that moment, as did everyone else who deals with this team. Because all of a sudden, number one, my editors at the Miami Herald were supremely interested, all of a sudden, in Inter-Miami. Not that they weren't interested before, but now 
the head editors, not just the sports editors, the executive editors, the publisher, they all wanted to get involved. Everyone knew who Lionel Messi is, and all of a sudden, this is a very important global story. All of a sudden, they said, you need to do a podcast. We need you to start doing a weekly podcast. I never did a podcast before. So my workload increased quite a bit. The pressure on me increased because now I'm competing with all of the Argentine journalists, which is very difficult, let me tell you, and they play by some different rules than we do over here. So, uh, it, you know, it was all of a sudden a lot more competition, a lot more pressure, a lot more attention, but a lot more fun covering the beat. So it's been crazy. When I first started with covering this beat at the beginning of this season, there were sometimes, sometimes I was the only one at the training session. Sometimes there were three or four. Now there are many, many, many more. And I have to get a wristband and we have to go through metal detectors to go to a training session. So Lionel Messi completely changed my life uh, as the beat writer for Inter Miami. I'm gonna pass on to Ben. How, tell us about your coverage of covering transfers. How is the transfer of Lionel Messi from PSG to Miami? How was that dealt with? How did you deal with it? And whatever else you wanna tell us. Yeah, I think if we get into the specifics of covering a story like that, the complication of the Messi transfer, and Guillaume will be able to touch on this in a lot more detail, is after the World Cup, there was a feeling that Messi would renew at PSG. And there was even some form of verbal agreement. But at the same time as those close to Messi were saying he might want to talk about the details, within the PSG camp, there was a lower optimism that anything might get done at that point. Flash forwards, and you have the Barcelona narrative, which, as Guillaume will go into, is one of the hardest things to navigate, not just because of social media, but also scrutiny of what I would call first-person sources. And you may speak to somebody who is in the room and is senior and should be able to tell you what was said in the room. And when you then call up the other person they were talking to in the room, you get a completely different story. And scrutiny of sources is one bit of advice that I always give to young journalists. The second thing which is equally as important is yes, speed in the digital age is important, but far more important is you have to be right. So be right, not first. And I'll pass it over to Guillaume because he's got a lot more insight, but the example of the point that I'm making and the difficulty and a crux of the messy transfer was about a week before the announcement to Inter Miami, Jorge Messi, Lionel Messi's father, had a meeting, to my understanding, with Joan Laporta. And in that meeting, he said to Laporta, this isn't happening, we know it's not feasible, it's all smoke and mirrors, there's a lot of media noise, but Lionel Messi is going to Inter Miami. That's what Laporta wants you to believe. <laughs> well, exactly. That's not what Jorge told Laporta. That's exactly what you're saying. But I think the point I'm making is that Jorge Messi, to my knowledge, came out of that meeting having informed Laporta that Messi would be then going to Miami. No, no, he no, then no, spoke no, no. to the no, no. media. He didn't. he didn't. We're going to get the real story here. We're <laughs> going to get to the bottom of this right now on this stage. That's what's, that's mm. what's in the book. <laughs> my, my, my understanding was that Jorge Messi came out of a meeting, told the media boss was a possibility, having already told Laporta he was going to enter Miami. It's more subtle than that, but we can either focus on it or, or we can go into the story itself. And uh, I don't know if you know, Michelle, but I think I broke the news, no, of the Messi going to enter mm. Miami. But I wanted to know, I think I should start there, how it, how it happened, because people think it happens generally in these glamorous restaurants or or when you are in the Eiffel Tower or something like that. <laughs> I was playing pool and I was losing. <laughs> and, uh, and I got the last message, the message that says, okay, you can publish. Mm -hmm. So I went like, my mate smokes. So I said, go and have a cigarette. cigarette. <laughs> Let's break pool for a minute. I just went like that. It was a very short message, if you remember. Put it out there and continue playing. And turn it around, I won. So that was the thing I remember the most about that day. Um, funnily enough, I was telling you this last night, I went to the same, this was in a pub in England. I went to the same pub and the, the barman, he was serving me and, uh, and I said, mate, do you know that Messi went to Inter Miami? This is in a little village 
in Lan Lancashire. No, in Leicestershire. <laughs> Little village. Little pub. Empty. I says, do you know that Messi has gone to Inter Miami? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know who broke the news? I said, me. And do you know where? In that pool table. <laughs> and he went like, which lager did you want? <laughs> so, <laughs> things that for us are massive. To actually get there first was, was, um, was a rush of blood. For the rest of the world, it's not that important. <laughs> so I think the conclusion for me would be, make sure that when you do that, because it will stick if you don't get it right, that is right, that you've done all the work. And okay, that day I was off and I was playing pool, but being able to tell that story at that point comes from uh, many years of, uh, of conversations, of listening, of, in the case of Leo Messi, and you know that very clearly now, is a very small group that deal with this stuff. And it's a tiny circle. Yeah. The messy circle is a tiny, tiny, tiny circle. The only one I could compare it to is I've covered a lot of tennis, mm. and the Williams family right. is also a very impossible n nut to crack. It's a very small circle. They have reason to not trust people. They have reason not That's to trust exactly. people. So they don't trust people. They don't trust us. They don't trust the media. To be able to break into that very small circle is very, very, very difficult. With the top, top, we're talking about the Serena Williams, Lionel Messi level athlete. They don't talk to that many people. A lot of people claim to be in the know, but they're really not. There are a few layers on the outside of I, the onion. I should tell but if you, you peel it down, it's a very few number of people who really knew what was going on. I should, I mean, obviously, I could tell you about 100 million things about their story and why they don't trust people. But I tell you what, I went with the idea, having done the Pep Guardiola book, of doing a book on Messi. And every book I do, they are my vision of them. It's not their autobiographies. I'm not a ghostwriter. Mm -hmm. I'm telling the story of them from my point of view, but speaking to them. And uh, I went to them and said, uh, look, I'd like to do a book on Messi. And the response was, no chance. <laughs> Forget it, no chance. Or can we have a meeting? No. And it went from there to being an authorized book. That's a very long story. But as you say, I, I had to go through all the layers to actually get to that circle. And since then, right. I've been, and to you know, do that, it is years and years of cultivating sources. Yeah. What you talked about, and Tom, we're going to talk to you about it, is that I teach a sports journalism course also at the University of Miami, and I tell my students. Breaking stories in journalism is about cultivating sources. People have to trust you. They have to be able to tell you something off the record, and sometimes you put it in your pocket and you don't even use it. You just keep it for your own knowledge and you use it later. The minute you burn a source, you have lost that source forever, and you lose every person who that source is connected to, because that source will tell everyone else, don't trust her, don't trust him, they burn me. And that's it. And your career will be very short. So if you're interested or if you're in the world of journalism or media relations, um, you know, the bridge, if the bridge burns down, it's very, very difficult to, re that to rebuild that bridge. So, Tom, can you tell us a little about how you break as many stories as you do and annoy me on a regular basis? Go ahead. <laughs> yeah, your point is, is the perfect one. It's, it's, you, it's relationship building. It's trust building. It's being genuine and authentic. I know that sounds corny, but like these are human beings. You're building relationships. This isn't, this isn't a business transaction. This isn't something more cynical. The people that trust you the most are the people that you can be authentic with and the people that you can vibe with in a, in a, in a less technical term, right? It's about the, the, the relationships because that, at the end of the day, is what makes you strongest. The, you're only as strong as your sources are. And if you're cutting corners, if you're doing things the wrong way, then the people who relate to you are going to be people who do things the wrong way and cut corners and are more cynical or business-like or a business transaction. So for me, it's always about aligning with people that I know I can trust, proving to them that, that they can trust me, ask the right questions, try hard, don't just always come in and, and say, oh, like, hey, what's the info? I, I, I want to break the news, right? Like, because then it, it really is a cynical, a business-like transaction. So again, it's a lot of time, like you said, um, people will look that uh, I kind of came into this world a few years ago in terms of regularly breaking a lot of stories around MLS. It didn't just happen like that. That happens from years. That happens from showing up at press conferences, asking the right questions, informed questions, 
showing that, again, you're a trustworthy and knowledgeable person who tries to do things the right way. You don't take people out of context. You don't kind of purposely take pot shots at people, right? Like, that's how people start to trust you. And with that trust, builds relationships. And as you said, if you burn a source, not only do you burn that person, you lose all the people that that person's close with. It works the other way as well. I've had people reach out to me and been like, hey, you're, you're somebody whose name was passed along to me that I asked so-and-so about, and, and he vouched for you. And this person said you do things the right way. So it, it, it's, again, it sounds very corny, but it's doing the little things right. It's, it's building these relationships and being a trustworthy person that ultimately works out in the end. I want to ask, because we have a global audience here, they said there are 2,000 delegates here from 80, uh, 80 countries, I believe. Um, I want to talk briefly, because we have different experiences from different countries, about um, what is sports coverage like in the United States? For example, what is Messi being asked to do here now? And we have some inter-Miami media relations people in the audience. Um, what is he being asked to do? And what was he asked to do when he was in Barcelona, when he's with the Argentine national team, when he's with PSG? And how are those things different? And how do we navigate those differences? Because here in the United States, the biggest NFL stars and the biggest NBA stars, they talk. They talk every week. Some of them talk every day. They talk before games. They talk after games. They do one-on-one -on -one interviews. That is not the case with Lionel Messi. It is not the case with some of the biggest stars uh, who come over from Europe. They're not used to this. They're not used to an open locker room. What the heck is that? An open locker room? That's crazy. Um, so the media landscape in the United States is very different from the, so among all the adjustments that Leo Messi has had to make to life in the United States, everything from driving in Miami, going to the grocery store, to dealing with the media here, which has d very different expectations. Well, Can you each talk about what, what was his life with the media like before he landed on our shores? Let, let me say, first of all, that um, you talk about Messi adapting to the MLS. I think the MLS has to adapt to Messi as well because we are talking about somebody that cannot be treated like everybody else in media terms. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I have heard that there are complaints that he's not doing the things he's supposed to. He's never, ever done a documentary, ever. <laughs> he's never spoke after games as he's done with Apple TV. He actually gave this press conference, the famous press conference in August, and gave five one-on-ones, one with the uh, Miami Herald, which he doesn't do before. It's never ever done as much. Obviously, if anybody into Miami or, or you or, or the MLS will want Messi to be open and talk every, ta every time, it's not gonna happen. Right. It's not gonna happen. So I'm not saying you should be happy with it. I think we as journalists have to push for more. I think into Miami and MLS have to understand that they need to have the infrastructure in place for somebody like Messi, because quite clearly, uh, and Xavi was touching on it before, they, everybody's prepared for it. You know, he's coming, Adidas is prepared. Adidas has was prepared for it. <laughs> and it's like, oh my God, <laughs> uh, nothing like this. And they're already struggling for next season share. It's, it's a phenomenon of worldwide proportions. You got more than anybody else got on Messi. That's the way to put it in my eyes. Very good. Ben, do you agree that he's done already more in four months with Inter Miami and MLS? He's done more appearances and more media than he had done in Europe. Yeah, I think it speaks to the sort of terms of the deal and the structure of it as well. And when you sign a player like that and you're trying to build something with player buy-in that ultimately leads to the 2026 World Cup and beyond, then there is going to have to be more of an acceptance on Messi's part that there's different aspects of media. But I can speak more, for example, to his time at PSG. And Guillaume, no doubt, can add Barcelona. That's two very unique clubs, even by European standards. So you've not only got Messi and the fanfare that he draws and the uniqueness of the player, you've got the uniqueness of Barcelona. He moves to PSG, and there's a very long settling period. And then towards the back end of his time at PSG, you've got the politics because Nasser Al Khalifi is trying to redefine PSG and if you ask those close to PSG they will tell you they're trying to move away from player power and that was maybe illustrated at least from the PSG perspective 
by the story around Messi having a commitment in Saudi Arabia, PSG not being happy about it. Again, scrutiny of sources, there were two sides there, but Messi traveled, PSG didn't like it, he was suspended for two weeks, it became one week, they shook hands, they made up, and we saw that with Mbappe as well, where PSG were effectively slagging off Mbappe quite publicly, and now suddenly they're the best of friends. So this is the spin, this is the challenge, and within that, European media landscape, Messi and Mbappe tried in many ways to sort of keep their heads down, be the model professional and not bite and engage with the media. And I think, Guillaume and Tom, they don't bite and engage with the media because they know that every single media lining up are going to have a different headline, a different story and a different smokescreen. So sometimes it's just better to stay silent. And quite clearly everybody wants to uh, manage the message and yeah. want to control the image, and, and that is the battle for us as well. And how can you really get the real Messi? Can, how can you really get the real Mbappé? Only by writing a 750-page book. <laughs> but His book is for sale, I think. <laughs> <laughs> you want to tell us how much does it cost? What bookstores is it in? No, I'm just kidding. It's not coming to America until February anyway. But, but no, what I'm trying to get at is that it's, it's not easy because to actually get to the essence of it, you have to go through all these... Uh, obstacles that, that we're talking about and um, but one thing on Messi anyway what you see is what you get so once you sit down with him that's the guy mm -hmm. there's no there's no other guy behind it there's there's a there's a shy guy that has learned and I've gone I've done commercial events with him since he was 22 the first time it was like oh my god it's like <laughs> but Leo there's only 15 people in the audience it's like oh <laughs> Uh, to now manage a Ballon d'Or presentation, like from the look to the beard to the, to the <laughs> haircut. To, and he did prepare a little bit, but not a lot, what he said. So it's been all that evolution. So he has an image in front of the public, but when you sit with him, what, what you see is what you get. Yeah, Tom, can you talk quickly about um, MLS? You cover MLS, you cover all the other teams in MLS. How, is, how has the media accepted him and, and do you think that the media will be willing to accept that he is different like Guillaume was saying it is different and we should not have the same expectations as we do for even some of the other quote-unquote big stars in MLS yeah absolutely because there is no other example of Messi there is no contemporary he's greatest of all time there is a, a unique deal to bring him to Major League Soccer so right off the bat that's something that's different the stratosphere of Messi is much different speaking with other clubs Look, they know that they'll sell out if Messi is on the calendar coming, coming to their games. That, that's helped them financially. They also know that they need to increase security. Um, when he made his MLS debut at the New York Red Bulls, this is after he already played in Leagues Cup or whatever, um, the Red Bulls had a lot of different security measures than they did at every other game that, that I've covered there. Um, they had a different room for the press conference. They had different, and Messi wasn't even speaking, right? Because there was just so many more journalists. There's so much more interest so much more fans, and you have to worry about fans going on the field, like with his bodyguard and, and the security. Um, they have to scrutinize people asking for press passes, because what if this is, maybe he writes for a blog, but maybe he's also mostly a fan and just wants to get closer to Messi. So these are things that you don't have to worry about with any other players. Even again, Zlatan Ibrahimovic, huge, massive star. Wasn't the same for him, right? Like So I think uh, the clubs around the league understand that this is all different, and most of it is positive because it's different in that we're selling a lot more tickets and we're selling tickets for a lot more uh, dollars. Does anyone have questions? Any burning questions? Yes. <laughs> Right. Right. She's asking, yeah. I believe, how do we try to, how do we maintain credibility and the fundamentals of journalism in this wild, wild world of journalism now, which is basically anybody with a cell phone now considers themselves a journalist because they have a Twitter account and they put stuff out there. And it happened this year with uh, Lionel Messi's injury. You know, we had somebody who none of us had ever heard of 
all of a sudden posting a tweet saying that he knew from a source inside the club that he had a two centimeter tear of his hamstring. And all of a sudden we all were sent into, you know, our heads were spinning. Oh my God, Messi has a two centimeter tear. According to whom? According to some guy that none of us knew who he was. It was not a journalist. It was, I mean, it was sort of a journalist, but someone who said he was a journalist, but not anyone that's ever covered the team, not anyone that we ever knew. These are the things we have to sift through. So, so how, how do you do it? With a lot of defeats <laughs> of not being first or second or third and actually having to check. And because it's a, I tell everybody you were talking about students or people that approach you, new journalists, young journalists, it's like, it's a, long, it's a marathon, it's a long term run. Just don't try to be first because that could actually destroy you. And you mentioned it earlier. If once your prestige <laughs> is affected, just once, not only you stop sleeping for a month. It just affects you for a long, long, long time. So it's not worth it, it's not worth it. So it's just a, a matter of, of making sure that what you put out there, it's reliable, trustworthy. You know, Cristiano Ronaldo wanted to take me to court for something I wrote, and he never did, because I, I was sure that what I said was the right thing. How about the, both of you, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I think the first thing to your point about competing is within the industry, there's a lot more respect than maybe people realize. So uh, we're not constantly just going for one story and then being like, damn it, Guillaume beats me to everything, which is true, by the way, because he's brilliant, especially on Messi. But you're talking to your colleagues, you're working collaboratively within your organizations, and you're standing up things directly. So if something comes out like the Messi tear, you're still going to the right people yeah. and getting it firsthand rather than just presuming anything because you just never know and for me and transfers in particular away from something longer running like Messi the challenge is that the transfer window is unreliable not necessarily the journalists and with social media you may put something out there at one point and it may change mm -hmm. and all people will see is social media and you'll get burned but maybe you were not wrong at that point in time so to Guillaume's point you have to work out when you're going to release it and how you're going to release it so with for example away from Messi the Saudi Pro League it's a new unique beast of deal makers and sources all over the place that are quite lucid but sometimes quite unreliable and as Victor Osterman said yesterday he had an offer from Al Hilal which in hindsight is now known and he was tempted by it and three times they tried to sign him, going up and up and up in money. Now, when I reported that at the time, nonsense. They're not going for Osterman. They're not bidding for Osterman. Osterman's not tempted. Yesterday, he said it on record. So I think when you're navigating, Tom, the landscape, I would say anyway, use social media, but ignore social media. Get everything firsthand. And where possible, be right, not first. <laughs> And if you can, of course, be right and first. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Right and first is the goal. But yeah, <laughs> if you have to choose one right and then, you know, be right and be second. And don't never just retweet. You know, very rarely do you just retweet something just because something is out there, unless it's somebody that you really, really, really trust. If you see something, then you say, oh, OK, yeah. this guy says he has a two centimeter tear. Let's go try to talk to my sources that I trust and see what they say. Tom, how do you sift through all the garbage? Yeah, it, it gets frustrating. I have a, a lot of people, I've seen all of us talk to sources, talk to fr whoever all the time. We're on our phones way too much. We're on the computer way too much. Um, and there's a lot of crap out there, right? Like everybody's a fake insider, all these anonymous accounts, everything else. Um, so it does get difficult, it does get frustrating, particularly if, if you ask sources about a story that's just completely not true. And it's now you're taking up their time, bothering them with something that's stupid. So. You need to sift through, you need to have media literacy. I do think we're getting better at that just in general. People are believing less just blindly what they see on the internet. I think that people, they'll look at Gillian, they'll look at Ben and Michelle and myself and think, okay, if they say it, it's real, it's true, we can trust it. So maybe I just need that belief for my own sanity, for my own mental health, but that's kind of where I view things and, and you try hard not to, not to take everything you read seriously. Any other questions? Yes, Fernando. Tell us what happened in Paris, how your husband and you finished the vacation. <laughs> <laughs> that was something big. 
It was? Vacation messy. Vacation messy. Well, I will tell you that I had a feeling the story was going to break the day before. So when my husband went to sleep, I went into the bathroom of the hotel room, which maybe all of you have done, if you're in a room with somebody and they have to sleep and you have to work. I put the bath mat on the floor of the bathroom, I took out my laptop, and I wrote the story as completely as I could so that I would have it ready to go, hoping that I could still enjoy some of my vacation time the next day with my husband. So while he was sleeping, at two and three in the morning, Try to picture me, I was sitting on the floor of the bathroom of the hotel in Paris, typing up Messi is coming to Miami story. And I left just a few blank spaces so that when I did the next day get the phone call under the Eiffel Tower, I then went to, back to the hotel with my husband. We stopped, at a caf we stopped at a cafe first and he got a very large beer. I got an ice cream. I went back to the hotel and I just had to fill in a few parts of the story, some of the details of the contract that I was able to get from a very good source. Um, but all of the rest of the story in the background was already written. And I did that on the floor of the bathroom. That's inside information you're getting now. Um, so story. that is, so then we were able to go have a nice dinner after I filed my story and we toasted. My husband was very proud of me that I had the story not first, but close to first on America, among American journalists. I had a very long, complete story because I was prepared, because I had done my homework, and because I spent many hours on the bathroom floor writing the story in advance. Try one. <laughs> Try one to finish. And yeah, someone had a question over here. Yes. Uh, so there's actually news at Purdue's comp shop right now. Okay. Uh, Carla Say is not coming back to the It's not. Yes, it, that's tough. That specific story, I was standing over there reporting on trying to find out more details about it. I had, I had a feeling that something was coming, or I was told something might be coming soon. So up until I walked onto this stage, I was still looking at my phones at the side time. And that's just a symptom of this job. This is just a symptom of this world that I remember being on vacation with my now fiance, and uh, we're going from dinner and then going to go get a drink. And in the walk from dinner to a drink, I get a text, I have to make a call, and she's very understanding, which is why that was one of the reasons I proposed. But in just on vacation, I'm making a phone call to a source. Source picks up the phone, and because and, I, I texted him, I said, I can, I can, two minutes, man, like I'm on vacation, like I, I can't. And the first thing he said was, put your phone down, like treat her better, something, something joke like that. But that's what it is, man. It's just, you have to be on your phone at all times, or you get left behind. Yeah, we I have think. a red, oh, we're gonna, t we're, we'll take the last answer here and then the red zero zeros are flashing, meaning that we're out of time. Go ahead, Ben. Yeah, I was just gonna say briefly, Chris, it's not just us. We might be the catalyst for a story, phones buzzing, 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 but then that manifests into calling an editor or a producer, a graphic designer. So you're ruining somebody's evening at a whole company or in a whole network. And then anything you put out there will have responses. And there's a lot of people out there on social media that just want you to be wrong, either because they support the other club and the player is leaving, or because they simply engage in that manner. So you have to have a work-life balance. It's difficult. It's rewarding when you're right on a story and you claim ownership of it. But I definitely think there's a wider conversation to be had another day about how any journalist out there gets that work-life balance and how we ensure if we're engaging in digital platforms that it's respectful. Any Not final far. words, Guillaume? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very short answer. I'm 55 and I think I'm about to start a balance. Hasn't been any balance <laughs> yeah. up till exactly. now. Exactly. <laughs> doesn't exist. I don't know of it. I don't know of it. No. Impossible. Well, we want to thank you all for listening, for showing up. Enjoy the rest of the conference and welcome to Miami. Yes.